Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining the latest version of the Palisade webinar. This version is the second in a recent series that we've been focusing on homomorphic encryption for Palisade users, a tutorial with applications. Our speakers today are Yuri Polyakov and David Cousins. Um, Yuri, and Poly Yuri and David are the uh, co-founders of the Palisade Library. They've been working on it for uh, many years, both in development and applying it for a number of uh, uh, operational use cases. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a particular focus of the Palisade uh, Library support for some particular encryption schemes in episode two, which we're currently in, focused on integer arithmetic operations with applications of homomorphic encryption over the integers. This was among some of the earlier aspects of homomorphic encryption for operations on integers. And we'll be talking about how we've been supporting this in Palisade, particularly for applications. Speaking first, I believe is Yuri, if that's correct. That is correct. Uh, thank you, Kurt. Uh, thank so, you, Yuri. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have uh, two uh, talks today. The first one is more theoretical about uh, integer arithmetic, and the second one will discuss applications of integer arithmetic. Uh, and uh, maybe there are some related talks, and uh, uh, it uh, would be helpful uh, to also, I mean, to get a, uh, to understand the terminology because we're going to use the same terminology uh, to also uh, watch the introduction to homomorphic encryption. Uh, webinar to A that was done uh, last time, uh, but I'll still try to introduce the concept along the way. But it is, uh, would, it would be helpful to also watch that webinar uh, in addition to the one that I'm going to present. And there are some other webinars uh, uh, that are also available at the PalisadeCrypto.org webinar. So it's uh, uh, they complement what is covered in this particular talk. Uh, so the agenda of uh, today's. Um, talk uh, is the following. So first, we're going to introduce the basics. What arithmetic operations are supported homomorphically? Well, we're going to identify those. Uh, we're going to discuss what are the typical data structures that we work with. Uh, we're going to provide the full list of primitive operations that uh, all homomorphic computations based on integer arithmetic are uh, built from. We will talk about the question of encoding, how uh, plain text can be encoded, which is non-trivial in this case. Uh, we will discuss parameter selection and the three main parameters, plain text modulus, ciphertext modulus, and ciphertext dimension. We'll also talk about which scheme to use because there are two different schemes uh, in Palisade that support integer arithmetic. Uh, we will go through a code example and also we will briefly touch some of the more advanced topics. Uh, so, uh, the first uh, part is the basics. And uh, uh, the first fundamental question is, what uh, type of computations should we use integer arithmetic for? I mean, should we use the uh, integer arithmetic capability in Palisade or just the homomorphic encryption for? And uh, the first use case, and it's the most common one, is uh, to provide support for exact integer arithmetic, typically for relatively small integers. And relatively small, uh, in the case of Palisade, means restricted to 32-bit integers. That's that's the uh, uh, limit that we uh, set on uh, basically the main, the, that's the bound that we use for any computations. And uh, the way these computations work, so first of all, we support two basic operations, addition and multiplication. Then there is a certain uh, uh, bound introduced, and we'll discuss uh, it a little bit more uh, further in the talk and it's called plain text modulus. And uh, up to that bound, what we have is just normal addition. So 123 plus 456 equals 579. 12 multiplied by 432 equals 5184. If, however, we do a computation that goes above that bound, uh, in the case of exact integer arithmetic, we get essentially an overflow condition similar to overflow condition when working with, let's say, 32-bit or 64-bit uh, integer arithmetic in regular computers. Uh, then there is another potential, I mean, there, there's another use case or types of computations that are supported. Uh, 
using this uh, capability, uh, uh, homomorphic encryption capability, is the computation essentially over finite fields or modular arithmetic. And uh, a very, uh, I mean, a typical example would be working with uh, eight bit unsigned integers, modular to 56, for instance. Uh, uh, they essentially the structure that's used, uh, the finite field structure that's used for AS. And uh, if our goal is to support this modular arithmetic, then uh, the approach that we're going to describe fits really well into this case uh, and natively supports modular arithmetic. But in practice, this is only relevant for very special use cases. It's because uh, very often we're interested in actual integer arithmetic rather than modular arithmetic. Uh, but both uh, scenarios are supported. So uh, now the question of data structures. So uh, what, how are those uh, integers grouped together and what kind of structures uh, and which kind of structures are native uh, for this type of arithmetic. And uh, the most common approach is uh, to work with a vector of bounded integers. And although, I mean, from the mathematical perspective, we call it a vector, but in reality, it's just an array because it, the size of that uh, vector is fixed. So essentially it's array functionality, but it's just uh, easier to understand it, uh, and refer to it as a vector. And many integers, typically between 2000 uh, and 64,000, I mean, approximately 2000, 64,000, it's actually power of two, are packed, put together into one vector. And uh, that vector is what gets encrypted and uh, we perform all operations on that vector. And a very important parameter is the size of this vector. And uh, we're going to denote it as n, and it's, it's a power of two number. So uh, that's a, a very important consideration. And uh, the benefit of uh, grouping together, of batching these integers into a single vector is to support operations in a, a CMD manner, in a single instruction, multiple data manner, uh, so like vectorized manner, similar to let's say AVX instructions or similar to uh, conventional computer architecture, CMD models. And the idea is we can perform component-wise addition or multiplication of N integers, so 2,000 or 64,000 integers using a single addition or multiplication operation. So uh, this is a fundamental capability uh, that makes uh, this approach very appealing in practice. Uh, and uh, Dave's talk will discuss and, uh, and show the differences, for example, in the approach where this uh, packing capability is used versus where it's not used. And since we're introducing vectors, essentially because vectors are the native structures we're going to work with, we also need to define one more primitive operation in addition to addition multiplication. And this operation can be I mean, we, we can be called a uh, rotation. I mean, uh, we, can, uh, we can think of it as a rotation. And essentially it's, uh, it's an operation that allows us to access values at specific indices or to rotate or shift uh, all values in the vector. Uh, since vector is our native structure, this operation is considered as a primitive operation. So addition, multiplication, our rotations are three primitive operations on which we build any integer homomorphic encryption computation. Uh, and uh, there are some special use cases where it's more convenient to work not just with vectors of integers, but with some specialized structures, such as uh, matrices of bounded integers, or let's say polynomials with bounded coefficients or high precision integers. In this case, we can use a, some slightly more uh, complicated or slightly different approach to uh, for encoding or uh, uh, to represent the data structure. Again, this scenario is much less common and it does require typically more advanced math knowledge than just the concept of working with, with vectors. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, and for instance, for some scenarios, high precision integers are very often not needed in practice. And there, there's another approach that we'll discuss in the next webinar where uh, it's better to use approximate homomorphic encryption for that. So now that we've discussed uh, the main concepts and the main data structures, we're going to define all primitive operations that uh, the uh, integer arithmetic homomorphic encryption supports. So 
the operations are, so as we previously mentioned, addition, multiplication, subtraction, uh, uh, these operations are supported and in Palisade, they're called eval add uh, for addition, eval mal for multiplication, eval sub for subtraction. And very important also notion that uh, there are two flavors of operations that are supported where the inputs are two ciphertexts or where the uh, one input can be a ciphertext and the other is a plain text. So it's, it's both of these computations are supported and, uh, and we'll discuss a little bit more uh, where the ciphertext plain text computations can be beneficial. In addition to that, uh, we also have unary operations. So the operations that work on the vector itself, such as negation, which is called uh, eval negate in Palisade and uh, vector rotation, which in Palisade is called eval at index. And uh, some one important note, whenever we, we do any computation, we always get an um, encrypted uh, result. Even if one of the inputs is a plain text, we still get uh, uh, a ciphertext as the result. And uh, this, is, uh, this gives us additional benefit in practice because you can mix computation, uh, let's say that involve uh, data and uh, model and uh, the model can be in the clear, the data encrypted, or uh, data can be in the clear, or the model is encrypted. And uh, the, uh, the benefit is whichever of these two computations you perform, you're still going to get encrypted data as the result, the encrypted result. So it's a, it's a, it's a beneficial uh, feature of uh, homomorphic encryption. And uh, this concludes the initial uh, uh, discussion of the basics and we're going to move to the data encoding techniques. Uh, so uh, I'll check if there are any questions. So uh, Kurt, are there any questions that need to be answered or I can just proceed further? Um, no questions so far. We of course encourage our participants to uh, put questions on the Q&A or on the, the, the chat panel. Uh, we're monitoring both as we go and I don't see any so far, but uh, we're just getting started. Okay, yep. so we'll go to the next uh, chapter. So data encoding techniques, it's a fundamental question. So uh, the data encoding technique is directly related to the previous discussion of data structures that we had. And uh, this uh, native data structure of a vector of bounded integers uh, is the main data structure. And there is an encoding uh, in Palisade, it's called packed encoding. And we often refer to this just as standard packing, sometimes CRT packing. That's the most common way of uh, working uh, with integers in, uh, uh, in this uh, integer arithmetic approach. And the idea is, so we pack bounded integers in a vector of size n. So that size that we discussed previously, something that's in the thousands. And then we support component-wise addition, eval add, and multiplication, eval mult. So component-wise means, so in this case, we're just looking at the, uh, 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 I mean, simplified, I mean, we have a simplified view, we have a vector with three components, and we're showing it that addition and multiplication are performed component twice. That's the functionality that uh, is natively provided by this packed encoding. And uh, as we mentioned before, we add the rotation operation, which in Palisade, again, is called evaluate index. And uh, um, for this eval index operation, uh, we basically we can supply either a positive index or negative index. And the positive index means uh, shifting numbers to the right within a vector. Uh, the negative index means shifting uh, numbers to the left within um, uh, the, the vector. And just uh, there is some uh, special comment related to the use of power of two. Uh, 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 ciphertext uh, dimension uh, in our case, which is uh, which is the which is the main scenario that we use. That when we do rotations, they work with uh, size of uh, n divided by two. So essentially, when we do a rotation, it actually does the rotation in two on over two equal basically parts of the vector, uh, half the vector, and uh, so it's just something that has to be kept in mind. Um, and um, yeah, this is the most common way to do the encoding. Then, uh, uh, I mean, Palisade supports actually six or seven different uh, encoding methods, uh, but we'll list uh, here only the two other uh, methods that sometimes can be useful. Uh, and uh, again, I would like to highlight that the packed encoding is 
the the most common method that is used in the majority of applications. So the other two encodings that we're going to consider here are coefficient encoding and integer encoding. So the coefficient encoding, coefficient packing, uh, in Palisade is called Clef uh, packed encoding. Again, it packs bounded integers into a vector of size n, but the restriction that it has is that it only supports addition over those vectors, not multiplication. So the multiplication of our multi operation has this different meaning in this case. It's basically some form of polynomial multiplication. So uh, it's only good for additions. And uh, in, in, on top of that, there, 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 is, there are some uh, special purpose, I would say, uh, limited capabilities that are provided uh, for this encoding, such as scalar multiplication, so multi multiplying by scalar, and uh, certain types of rotations. I mean, but it really very, I would say even permutations are the rotations. And the, uh, this particular packing can be used when no multiplications are needed. That's, I would say that that's, uh, that's probably the most typical use case of this QF packed encoding. Or, or, you're, or we're trying to work with some special data structures like polynomials and that have different meaning. And then there is another encoding, integer encoding, which allows us to uh, essentially support high precision integer arithmetic, exact integer arithmetic, but uh, there is a very significant cost for this. The cost is that we have to use uh, one uh, ciphertext for each integer rather than one ciphertext for let's say thousands of integers. So higher precision arithmetic can be supported, but um, it has a very high uh, performance cost. So again, in most scenarios, uh, we don't wanna use it for efficiency purposes, but it, it, I think it's good to understand that those two options are available. Um, and uh, this concludes the discussion of encodings and we're going to move uh, to the parameter selection uh, chapter. Uh, so just wanna uh, quickly check if there are any questions. Uh, it appears that there are none in the uh, Q&A, right, Kurt? Yep, yeah, please, uh, please keep going forward. Sure. Okay, parameter selection. And, and we're, we're trying to go over different uh, practical aspects of properly configuring and understanding this integer arithmetic. So that, that's, so, uh, and parameter selection is certainly one of the fundamental uh, uh, parts of that. So what are the main parameters? So the first parameter is the plain text modulus. And essentially, if we talk about the integer arithmetic, it is the bound uh, that we specified in the case of exact integer arithmetic. If you go over that bound, you get an overflow condition. So that's the meaning of plain text modulus in this case. Uh, in the case of modular arithmetic, plain text modulus is, the mod is, is essentially the modulus that's used uh, for the underlying algebra. Uh, so in, in that case, uh, there is no uh, such concept as overflow, you're actually doing modular arithmetic. So in depending on which particular scenario, whether you're dealing with exact integer arithmetic or you're dealing with uh, modular arithmetic, that's basically the meaning that this plain text modulus gets. Then uh, the second parameter is ciphertext modulus Q. And it is the main functional parameter that uh, determines how many computations we can perform. And going back to the uh, previous introductory lecture means how much noise we can tolerate. Uh, and uh, very often the ciphertext modulus is determined by the multiplicative depth of the computation uh, basically that the user wants to perform. So this depth of multiplicative depth, which we'll discuss a little bit more um, further in this talk, uh, is a fundamental parameter and it determines this uh, ciphertext modulus Q. So from our perspective, it's these two parameters are interrelated and it's the multiplicative depth that uh, the user typically specifies. And then there is the ciphertext dimension N, which we already uh, saw in the previous uh, slides. And it has two meanings basically, it's a, uh, and, uh, or, and even purposes in a sense. So the first meaning is related to security. So we need to choose a certain minimum value of N based on the desired security level and uh, 
essentially the amount of computations that we want to support the ciphertext module of queues. So there is a certain minimum value we have to choose for the implementation to be secure uh, from the perspective of uh, lattice problem, uh, ring learning with errors problem. Uh, and it also has another meaning in the context of this packed encoding that we discussed, standard uh, packing that we discussed, it's uh, also the size of uh, the vector. So it's how many integers we're essentially packing into this vector. So it's, it's both of them are determined by the same ciphertext dimension n. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about the guidelines for choosing these three parameters or uh, basically, or setting other user um, level parameters that control uh, these three fundamental uh, parameters of uh, for, uh, homomorphic encryption. So, in the case of exact integer arithmetic, uh, we want to avoid potential overflow condition. So, we have to, uh, before we do the computation, we have to find the worst bound essentially that can be achieved in that computation. And uh, the reason why the worst case, we have to use the worst case bound very often is because we don't know the actual encrypted value and we know the range of that value typically, uh, such as in this case, let's say we have A in the range from zero to 18 and B is an integer in the range from zero to, to 57. Um, so, to estimate the value of this bound of this plain text modulus P, we have to assume that we are multiplying two largest values. So we're multiplying 18 and by 257, uh, and we want to accommodate that uh, and make sure we choose the plain text modulus that supports this computation. So this is a very important exercise one has to go through in the case of exact integer arithmetic. Um, uh, to choose the modulus. If uh, the modulus, plain text modulus is too small, we'll have an overflow condition and the result itself will uh, not make any sense. And uh, so there is one other consideration that is specific to packed encoding, to standard packing. And the kind of consideration is that uh, we cannot just choose an arbitrary integer p uh, for the plain text modulus. We have to uh, 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 choose a basically we have some constraints and uh, uh, the, typically the main constraint that it should be a special prime that's basically uh, compatible with our encoding method. And uh, while in many uh, scenarios, we, it's, we can just simply use the default value of uh, plain text modulus P equal to 65,537. It's, it's a certain value that works uh, for most, I mean, for most depths. Uh, 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 it's, uh, I think it's important to understand that in Palisade, you can also find certain plain text modules based on your requirements. For instance, you want to support 32-bit arithmetic or 16-bit arithmetic, uh, then there is a special function called first prime that can be called. And in this case, bits would specify how many bits we want to support for the exact integer arithmetic. And, uh, and then uh, there is a, we have to uh, supply to multiply by n because that's, that's another constraint that is used for this plain text modulus. Uh, and if n is not known, I mean, the, depending on, because it's also related to the security, then uh, there is a certain default value that one can use. But it, it's very important to note that plain text modulus impact encoding has special constraints. And if uh, the, and if the user selects a plain text module that's not compatible, Palisade will throw an exception explaining that. Um, and uh, so, so additional note, if we deal with other types of encoding, for instance, quaff packed encoding and integer encoding, then uh, this constraint is gone. So essentially, uh, we don't need to uh, select any special primes. Uh, we just need to choose a number that doesn't cause an overflow in the case of exact integer arithmetic. Uh, and again, I would like to highlight uh, the point that overflow is an issue if we're trying to do exact integer arithmetic. If we're trying to, if we work with modular arithmetic, uh, this modulus is the modulus for the native algebra that we're working with. So it's, it's the desired feature rather than uh, something that uh, constrains us. <clears throat> 
So the next parameter that we're going to discuss is the ciphertext modules. And uh, uh, we already mentioned that it's the main functional parameters uh, you know, that is determined by the computation. And uh, we previously showed that whenever we perform any arithmetic computation in homomorphic encryption, uh, the noise gets increased. And it's important to choose the value of the ciphertext modulus that's large enough to accommodate the noise from all arithmetic operations and that, that wouldn't cause a wraparound. So as we discussed in the previous talk, uh, introduction to homomorphic encryption, uh, so this ciphertext modulus Q is, is the fundamental parameter that essentially captures this. And from the noise perspective, uh, multiplication is uh, dramatically costlier than addition. So in other words, it adds much more noise. It, it adds noise, uh, I mean, that is equivalent to let's say tens or hundreds of thousands uh, of additions in some cases. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, and this is why the noise of multiplication is often used as the uh, main input to estimate the ciphertext modules. So for instance, in Palisade, you, you do not specify the actual, I mean, in most cases, in most common cases, you do not actually specify the ciphertext modulus Q, but you specify the multiplicative depth and plain text modules, and it picks uh, the appropriate uh, uh, ciphertext modules based on this input. And uh, speaking of the multiplicative depth, um, it's uh, important to understand that uh, there are different ways to perform multiplication. And uh, the multiplicative depth itself is not necessarily the number of multiplication that we have, let's say, in a chain product. Uh, and maybe just, just to illustrate this point, let's say we want to compute A multiplied by B, by C, and by D. Well, let's assume we're just talking about component-wise uh, vector multiplication. If we compute, let's say, A and B in the first step and C and D, uh, so at the first phase, if you compute uh, E equal to A multiplied B and uh, uh, F uh, that is equal to C multiplied by D, so in other words, we do those uh, two products uh, independently at one level. And if then we compute E multiplied by F, we're going to use only two levels. So we're breaking this computation into two levels and the depth requirement for this computation becomes two rather than three if we were to do it in a naive manner, just A multiplied by B, then, multiply, then the product is multiplied by C and then the product multiplied by D. And what it really means is that when we have a chained uh, product, we can uh, represent it as a binary tree and perform binary tree multiplication and it's the depth of that tree that determines the multiplicative depth that we need. So it's a very important consideration uh, that has to be kept in mind. Um, where, so for instance, if we did to, to compute something X taken to the power of 16, it doesn't mean that we need to, to use 15 levels. We can use a, a binary tree approach and essentially that would require like four levels for this multiplication. Then uh, the other, the th and uh, probably th uh, the last very important parameter that um, um, is uh, that we need to keep in mind is the ciphertext dimension n. So ciphertexts uh, internally are typically represented as two arrays of size n. Uh, and why two? Because that, that, that is used for the certain encryption uh, properties of the schemes. And uh, this size n, as we previously mentioned, should have a certain minimum value uh, to comply with the chosen security level and desired ciphertext modules. So there is a certain minimum constraint driven by security uh, when choosing the ciphertext dimension. And uh, as far as the security, uh, uh, how do we quantify security? Uh, so Palisade uses the uh, security levels specified in the uh, homomorphic encryption standard published at homomorphencryption.org. So it's the community standardization effort. And specific uh, levels of security that correspond to the work factor of uh, most uh, 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 successful attack, lattice attack, um, are used to in, in policy. So in, in a sense, HE standard 128 classic means that 
we want to achieve a work factor of 128 bits uh, and, uh, for attacks with respect to classical computers. There are also options for quantum computers. Uh, in some scenarios, we can also uh, use the value uh, that it's not set, that essentially we're not introducing any security constraint, but this is only for toy settings. Let's say when we need to debug something or we need to develop a new prototype and use smaller values of uh, a ciphertext dimension at the beginning. But otherwise, for any production-like use um, uh, of integer arithmetic, uh, one of these levels has to be uh, chosen. One of the standard level has to be chosen, depending on the desired security level. Uh, and uh, the other side of it is that the, the ciphertext dimension is also the size uh, uh, of the vector uh, of encrypted integers that we're dealing with. So to, when we talk about CIMD computation. And in certain very special situations, it may be desired uh, to use a ciphertext dimension that's larger than the minimum needed for the security, maybe just to pack more um, integers. Uh, uh, into this vector. And uh, we have an option, for that we have an option for the user to specify the ciphertext dimension n, and as long as it's at least as uh, uh, high as the minimum value that is uh, needed for, for a given security level, uh, Palisade will proceed further. Uh, so this concludes the discussion of three main parameters, and we're going to uh, discuss the selection of schemes next. Uh, uh, so let's check uh, the, there, it looks like there are some questions. Yeah, Yuri, uh, there is a question that came in. Um, question is, I'll, I'll read it, and I think you're the best person to answer it. Um, how exactly does Palisade determine multiplicative depth? Uh, the questioner asks, I thought Palisade's interface was similar to SEAL as in there's not really a concept of a computation object, just a bunch of statements using the eval star methods. Would you like to take a first pass on this, Yuri, and I'll type up some notes? Sure, sure, yeah, so let's, so the first one is a very good question. How does uh, policy determine the multiplicative depth? And currently, uh, essentially that uh, decision is made by the application developer. So the multiplicative depth, something that is used as an input parameter to generate uh, the context. And then uh, for a given application, uh, one can write basically, I mean, e either one can write a special uh, subroutine to estimate this depth. Uh, but at the moment, that's something that we consider as part of the pre uh, compilation, let's put it this way, uh, that's outside Palisade, the determination of the multiplicative depth. Uh, it's a very good question and it's a very important point in practice and uh, uh, we are, I mean, we have discussed uh, the possibility of including this uh, capability, if not in the Palisade itself, but maybe in some of the repos. So, it's, but it's a very, very uh, important question. Um, so the second question about the interface. So, I mean, I'll, I'll so, uh, I mean, I think maybe one, one aspect is uh, that uh, we'll uh, have an example, code example later, where I probably want to answer the question about how exactly the eval uh, interface, eval basically star uh, uh, API works in Palisade. But conceptually, you always have some notion of ciphertext because yeah, let's say you're doing a val add of two ciphertexts, ciphertext one and ciphertext two. So what exactly it represents, that's a different story, how it's internally represented, but there is a notion of ciphertext and there is a notion of playtext. And my understanding that something similar exists also in SEAL, it's not just in Palisade, it's just the, in, the def, in the definition of the standard API. But uh, we'll, when we go to the code example uh, uh, further in this talk, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, talk about this question again. Okay, sounds like uh, there are no more questions. Great, thanks Yuri. Um, I'll just type it up and uh, we'll go forward from there. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so which scheme to choose? So this is also, I mean, uh, so so far we've talked about uh, the integer arithmetic in a scheme agnostic manner. And in reality, there are two schemes that, and both of them are supported in Palisade. Uh, 
So there is the BFE scheme and then there is a BGV scheme. And we'll, tr and we'll talk about some differences between them. And of course, also in the context of Palisade and uh, the maturity of the development of the schemes. So uh, the first scheme, I mean, historically it's the second scheme, BGV was uh, proposed first, but uh, uh, we're looking at it from the perspective of Palisade. Uh, is uh, so the first scheme is Brakersky uh, Fenver countering scheme, and what's important and and, and we'll, when we talk about uh, both BGV and BFE, I'll explain a little bit more. Is that it uses uh, a certain form that uh, like most uh, where messages are encoded in most significant digits, and in this what it means is that uh, the ciphertext modulus remains the same throughout the computation and uh, the actual message is, is basically close to the modules. It's, it's something like uh, Q divided, uh, uh, ciphertext modules divided by plain text modules. I mean, it's, that's the scaling of the message. And as we perform computations, the noise itself grows and uh, until it gets very close to uh, the value that will essentially affect uh, uh, the correctness of the encoded message, the rounding of the encoded message. So the very important uh, considerations in most scenarios and, and the way the scheme design uh, is that the cipher text modulus remains constant and uh, the noise accumulates and uh, until a certain level. So we can, and we can estimate uh, the size of the cipher text modulus in advance. And from the performance perspective, uh, this approach has a significant cost for the operation of homomorphic multiplication since we're storing the message closer to like we're storing it in the most significant part and, and typically our ciphertext module are quite large hundreds of bits uh, the actual operation of uh, uh, homomorphic multiplication and scaling that's done under uh, under the hood is quite expensive and it's more expensive than its counterpart in BGV. So, uh, so there is a performance cost of this uh, convenient feature. And from the perspective of different variants that are implemented in Palisade, uh, so the two uh, efficient variants are BFERNS and BFERNS B. Uh, previous, I mean, we still have an older version of um, that uh, uses mixed uh, multi-precision integer R RNS um, uh, arithmetic under the hood, which is just simply called BFV in Palisade and has been available since 2017. But we do not recommend this uh, particular variant to be used anymore because it's much slower. It's, uh, it's uh, sometimes it's one order of magnitude slower than BFV RNS or BFV RNS B. And in terms of uh, the comparison between the two uh, uh, variants, I mean the RNS variants, the more efficient variants of BFV. BFV are, uh, so theoretically speaking, they are roughly equivalent in terms of noise growth and the computational complexity. There are only very small differences between them. Uh, in practice, I mean the practical implementation that we have in Palisade, BFV RNS is slightly faster and it, it's also been the, the main scheme since uh, December of 2017. So it has been exhaustively, exhaustively stress tested. Uh, so that's, in, in, and typically, and we'll, we'll discuss this, that we recommend using this BFE RNS variant. BFE RNS B was added a little bit later. Uh, again, it's quite comparable in efficiency, but it has not been as probably stress tested as uh, BFE RNS. So the, other scheme, the BGV, Brakersky, Gentry, Wake, and Tonatan scheme, uh, is different. Uh, I mean, it has, there are many things that are similar. It works with the same plain text space, the same integer arithmetic is supported or modular arithmetic, but how the messages are encoded is different. In this case, the messages are encoded in least significant digits. And this uh, brings about some differences. For instance, uh, uh, to support, uh, 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 controlled noise growth in this case, which uh, is uh, typical for level to homomorphic encryption schemes, uh, we have to, so we work with a gradually decreasing ciphertext module. So we start with a certain uh, relatively large ciphertext modules at the beginning. And then as soon as we, let's say, perform a multiplication, the, no the noise grows and to, uh, change the noise back to the previous level. So this scheme can be think of as a constant noise scheme. 
we have to perform an operation called module switching. It's, it's done under the hood. It's not, it's not uh, typically exposed to the user, uh, but uh, we have to perform this operation and reduce the ciphertext modules. So, it's, uh, so there is certainly some difference there. So in the case of BFV, we're working with the same ciphertext modules, but we let the air grow. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, BGV, uh, we uh, work, uh, so the noise level remains constant, but the ciphertext modulus becomes smaller. But the end result is the same, I mean, in terms of almost the same in terms of noise growth, but the mechanisms are different. And for this reason, the homomorphic multiplication is much faster in BGV because it, this module switching operation does a much more lightweight scaling. Uh, to control the noise. So this is, there is a very clear distinction in the performance of the homomorphic multiplication operation between the two. And in Palisade, the most efficient variant is called BGV RDS. So it's a full RDS residue number system variant. And uh, uh, there, I mean, we also have another BGV variant called BGV, uh, which has been available since 2017, since the very beginning of Palisade. Uh, but it's significantly less uh, efficient. Again, we're, we're talking about roughly an order of magnitude. And uh, so BGV RNS is certainly the preferred way to use BGV in Palisade. Uh, there is one note, however, that the BGV RNS was relatively recently added to uh, uh, Palisade. So the full RNS version, the most optimized version. So it was added in June of uh, 2020. And uh, yeah, so maybe uh, keeping all those facts in mind, uh, uh, we wanna say a couple of things about the choice of uh, BGV versus BFV and uh, specifically in the context of uh, the current Palisade implementations. Theoretically speaking, BGV and BFV have roughly the same noise growth. I mean, there's some, there some small differences and uh, uh, we'll discuss the differences in, in a different forum, but uh, Conceptually, they're very, very similar. Um, the implementation note that currently uh, the BGV implementation in Palisade is somewhat conservative in choosing the parameters for BGV. Uh, and uh, for that reason, the noise growth that one can observe in the current BGV RNS implementation might be higher, depending on the use case, than uh, for BFV RNS. Of uh, we still provide uh, a mechanism for a more advanced user with FHE expertise to basically essentially manually set some of the BGV parameters so they match. But uh, in the default setup, BGV uh, can, does not always use the optimal from the performance perspective settings uh, uh, and uh, uh, that give us the same noise growth as in BFV. But uh, this, uh, this is something that we're improving uh, I mean, at this moment, actually, uh, and uh, the and in the next version, uh, uh, BGV will have much tighter um, uh, parameter selection, and which will match essentially BFV. And uh, so, in view of all of the above, uh, for production-like scenarios, uh, we recommend using BFV RNS. For the, I mean, for the time being, if there is a need to get better performance especially let's say research projects um, or, or some research prototypes, then uh, BGV RNS would probably be give better performance. I mean, of course it's, it's uh, computation specific, uh, but uh, it's uh, so the, the, if speed is the main requirement and, uh, uh, and especially such as in a project, uh, uh, in a study for a safer research paper, then BGV RNS will probably give you better performance. So uh, this concludes uh, the discussion of uh, scheme selection. Uh, so let's see if we have questions. Yes, Yuri, there are two questions. Uh, the first question comes from um, um, one of our, our participants, which is how exactly uh, does homomorphic encryption work in the scenario, scenario of multi-party computation? I believe the short answer is that uh, there have been a number of publications about the use of threshold style schemes 
Um, and uh, that's not something we're necessarily covering in the short term here, but I believe it's something that we will be covering in a future episode of the webinar. Anything you would like to add, Yuri? Oh, yeah, maybe a very brief note. So there are different ways to work with multi-party computations. Some of them are already supported well in Palisade. Uh, so for instance, one approach is threshold FHE, but it's, it's, beyond, uh, uh, it's beyond the scope of this talk, just like Kurt mentioned. Uh, the other approach is proxy encryption, which is uh, useful for some scenarios. There is also a multi-key FHE approach, which uh, typically has uh, uh, the performance has a performance that's significantly lower and, and you know not very useful in practice, at least in, in, uh, I mean in the current state. Uh, but that's it's something certainly the multi-party aspect is something we're going to cover in one of the future webinars. Thank you. I'm typing that up. Uh, another question that came in is, could, could you elaborate on the MSB and LSB to encode messages? I don't understand how you can encode a full message using one bit. Um, my quick answer, and Yuri, please elaborate, is that the concept of MSB and LSB encodings are kind of similar to the concepts of MSB and LSB encodings used in um, computer architecture, where you basically decompose an integer into bits and then it's whether you put the MSB on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of a uh, polynomial. Um, and every polynomial basically is uh, um, encoded as a plain text. But Yuri, I'm sure you could elaborate more on that. Yeah, I think it's p p partially the problem is in the terminology. So uh, we actually refer to the encodings as MSD, most significant digit, and a least significant digit, meaning that digit is not necessarily a bit. You can think of it, the digit in this case being something of uh, the size of plain text modulus. So uh, what we're talking about is whether we're putting this uh, number that's up to the plain text modulus in the least significant part or most significant part. It's not the bits that we're working with. So uh, so that's so. In other words, uh, we're working with larger digits. We're not working with binary alphabet in this case. Um, so I, I think that answered the question. I think it's MSD versus LSD that it answers the question by uh, default. Uh, rather right. Than, mm -hmm. And the uh, question I asked you is, uh, Sebastian, please feel free to reach out uh, again or one-on-one. -on -one, we're very happy to talk about this because this is somewhat fundamental for the use of encodings, which is a little advanced, but also somewhat fundamental at the same time. Um, and then we have another question from Alexander. Uh, do you have some numbers on the performance differences between BFE RNS and BGV RNS, or at least a general idea on the order of magnitude? Yes, so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll give two answers. Uh, some very preliminary numbers were presented in uh, my Simon's talk, uh, I think at the beginning of May, uh, so it's, it's, it's available on YouTube. So we're with uh, a number, the numbers for the binary tree multiplication case. Uh, and uh, they, we will present much more detailed comparison uh, later, I mean, next month. Uh, so uh, we'll, the, we'll make that information available next month uh, with a more detailed comparison. Uh, at the higher level, uh, uh, it's less than an order of magnitude for sure. Uh, so uh, depending on the computation, uh, it could, it, the, difference could be up to let's say 4x, 5x, but again, this I'm really hand waving here because it's, it depends on the computation, how many uh, homomorphic multiplications are performed. So uh, the complete answer, uh, you will see the complete answer basically by the end of uh, November. So that's uh, the, the information. And Yuri, the, this, and just to be clear, this 4x to 5x comparison, uh, which one is typically faster? Uh, if we're, if we're uh, working with, uh, let's say, binary tree multiplication, something that we want to do multiplications, which is favorable for BGV, BGV would be the one that is faster uh, uh, for certain settings. But again, it's I want to be very. I would say it's it's the upper bound of improvement is probably four or five x. In reality, sometimes it could be two x. Uh, sometimes there are certain scenarios in which actually BFE can be better too. So that, that's that's. Uh, so the short answer is that this is highly highly dependent upon applications, like pretty much everything in a home for crypto, and uh, it 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 definitely takes a level of uh, sometimes experimentation, sometimes uh, expertise, sometimes blacksmithing, uh, 
And we're, we as a group a community for Palisade are always very happy to chat about this on a case by case basis for applications because sometimes it can be a bit nuanced. Yeah. yeah. All right. And thank I you very much. Yep. Okay, and uh, maybe one more comment. At a more general level, uh, we'll, we'll uh, we essentially provide some comparisons for certain uh, benchmarks uh, next month. But uh, just like Kurt pointed, it's it's uh, some uh, basically generic benchmarks are not always indicative of what one would observe in, this, in a specific application. So. Right, and Dave also added uh, my private message that uh, there is some benchmark code in the library too that people can run if they want to run similar workloads. True, true. Yeah, that's a very good point. So there, we use Google yep. Benchmark, uh, and there are some benchmarks already built for that. And essentially, the results that were presented at the Simon talk can be recreated uh, on the specific machine. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Yuri. I think that's all the questions for now. Okay, so we're going to move next to the code examples. I mean, to the code example, and it's it, it, and uh, maybe first we'll introduce what are the concepts, what are the classes that are used uh, in um, Palisade, because uh, also partially answering the previous question. So one aspect is crypto context. So there is a certain wrapper that encapsulates the scheme, crypto parameters, encoding parameters, uh, keys, and it's like the central uh, focal point that. Uh, manages everything. So we'll see that in the code example. Then there is a notion of ciphertext. So there is a ciphertext class and um, it basically stores ciphertext polynomials. So the representation of encrypted data, it stores these uh, um, objects. And then there is a certain, uh, again, I'm maybe using somewhat uh, conceptual approach because there is runtime polymorphism available, for example, for the plain text class. But there is also a notion of plain text that stores the plain text data, which you know, both raw and encoded. And uh, this is the class that supports different types of encoding in a polymorphic manner. So crypto context, ciphertext, and plain text are the critical, essentially, uh, groups of objects that we work with. And so we're going to look at a very basic example using BFERNS. Uh, that all that all it does is uh, essentially generates the keys, encryption, and then performs primitive operations such as addition, multiplication, and rotations, and then decrypts the results. And um, and we'll try to walk through these uh, parameters and and also uh, in the context of parameter selection. So one parameter is the plain text module. So in this case, we choose the default value of 65537, which satisfies special properties of packed encoding. Alternatively, one could write here uh, the line, line with the first prime and choose their own uh, plain text modules for a very special scenario. So uh, then, I mean, this parameter, then we have the parameter sigma, uh, which is the uh, standard deviation of uh, error distribution. To be honest, it's always 3.2. I mean, it's here for more, you know, kind of general reasons and partially historical reasons. Uh, so it's, uh, so error distribution is very important from the security perspective and we're using the value that's recommended by the HE standard. Yeah, so this parameter would only get changed if, if uh, basically different uh, security, um, uh, I would say latest parameter selection approach is used, but in most scenarios, it should be set to 3.2. Um, then we have uh, the parameter of security level, which is one of the levels that we previously discussed from the uh, HE standard. And then we have the parameter that specifies the multiplicative depth. Um, when those parameters are available, we can instantiate a crypto context for a given scheme using these parameters. And for instance, and, uh, this crypto context and, uh, that we discussed previously is going to be something that will essentially is a wrapper for all operations that we're going to perform, like eval add, eval mult, and so on. Um, and there is a special factory that uh, generates the crypto context. Something that's also very I mean, important and uh, uh, probably will be hidden in later versions of Palisade uh, that we also have BCRT poly as the type of uh, polynomial representation used for all RNS schemes, which, and these are the schemes that we suggest now, BGV RNS, uh, BFE RNS, for instance, we always use DCRT poly. So most likely you're, gonna, you're not gonna need to change this. So DCRT poly is what gives you the best uh, 
efficiency. And then, so once the crypto context is created, we need to enable certain features. In other words, groups of operations that are supported. And in this case, the operations are pretty basic. We want to enable the encryption and we want to enable uh, SHE operations, somewhat homomorphic encryption operations, because all we're gonna do is just addition multiplication and rotations. Then the next uh, part deals with key generation. And so it's important to create a key pair. Again, there is a uh, key gen method uh, that, uh, of the crypto context that creates the key pair, public and private key pair. And then uh, we also, so for operations such as multiplication and rotation, we need special auxiliary public keys that uh, in the context of uh, uh, Palisade are often called uh, evaluation keys. And uh, when one talks about multiplication, very, uh, very often the key, this uh, evaluation key is called reunionization key. So we need to generate those keys before we can perform multiplication and rotation operations. So if you don't generate these keys, Palisade will throw an exception saying that the keys need to be generated. So for the case of uh, multiplication, so it's pretty basic, you will specify, uh, uh, that we need to, to generate keys from the secret key. And then uh, for the evaluate index, so there's the rotation operation, we also have an, we have an option to specify which indices needed. So uh, we talked about positive and negative indices and essentially these are, this is an array of indices that will be supported and these are the rotations that we want, we're going to use. So the next step is uh, to do the actual encryption. And uh, first, uh, and in this case, we'll just work with the uh, uh, vectors of integers, relatively small vectors of integers. So first we instantiate each vector, and then we create a plain text object with proper encoding for it. And in this case, uh, the, pro the method to create packed encoding is crypto context make packed plain text. So under the hood, it creates the right encoding of the message so that it can be afterwards encrypted. And we're doing it for two other plain texts as well, because we're going to do operations with multiple uh, vectors. Once the encoding is created, we can encrypt this encoded messages. And uh, the encryption again is done through crypto context. We call encrypt. Uh, uh, then we supply the public key. Uh, uh, in this case, we're referring to the case of uh, uh, public key encryption and the encoded message, plain text one, plain text two, plain text three, and ciphertext one, ciphertext two, ciphertext three. Essentially those are store uh, objects of the ciphertext class. And now we're getting to the actual operations. And in the case of uh, the first case is addition. We essentially, uh, so this is to answer the question that was asked very early uh, in the talk. Uh, so to do the addition, we simply call crypto context eval add with of two cipher texts. And we're doing just another addition here just to show uh, how we're adding all three uh, cipher texts together. Then similar idea is used for multiplication. So we're just multiplying uh, cipher text together. Internally, as we discussed, there is an extra evaluation key that's used to support multiplication, but it's hidden in the API. So uh, any uh, operation such as some of you have heard of reunionization and key switching and so on, all those are done automatically by Palisade. Uh, and uh, in the default mode, they do not require the user to enter anything. I mean, to, to specify that. Of course, there, if, if there is a need to uh, optimize the performance further, then uh, uh, a user has a more advanced interface as well. And the next part is the homomorphic rotation. So we call, in this case, we're showing a valid index operation for a certain, for just the first ciphertext for four different indices. So one, two, minus one, minus two. And again, it's important that before we call this operation that uh, there is an evaluate index key gen uh, that was called I mean, at the key generation stage. If there is no key available, Palisade will throw an exception saying that uh, no key has been generated for uh, to support this particular type of rotation. And uh, essentially the last and the final part in the, in the code example 
uh, is uh, to show how we can decrypt. So we've gotten all those results, ciphertext add results, ciphertext mult results, ciphertext root one, et cetera. And we're going to call the decrypt method, uh, again, through the crypto context. We specify the secret key, uh, we specify the uh, ciphertext uh, input, and we specify the plain text output to which we're going to write this. And uh, essentially what we'll get as the plain text result is something that uh, can be displayed, can be, uh, Stored, etc., and uh, we're uh, so we're not including here the aspects of printing it out to the console output or, or uh, what happens at the post-processing stage. Uh, but the example that we use here is the simple integers example um, in the PKA module. Um, so um, I'm done with the code examples. Any uh, other questions before we move to the last part of this talk? Yuri, um, there was a question that was coming in from Hassan that basically um, asking whether we can skip key generation and use pre-generated keys that were generated or obtained outside of Palisade. Um, I was just typing up an answer that basically says that Palisade has the ability to pre-generate keys, serialize them, store them, transport those keys, have those keys be used by other users who would deserialize them um, and other in Palisades of instances of Palisade. Um, and Dave had mentioned to me also on the side, which I'm also typing up, that there are demos for key serialization um, and deserialization that are in the code that, that show how to do this. Um, I was also going to mention that uh, standards for key representations are still nascent and interoperability between different libraries, although theoretically possible, has not been a major pursuit by any of the libraries so far that we are aware of although we do quite often with, with the other major uh, libraries, uh, such as SEAL in these regards. But uh, like I said, we do put a lot of effort, particularly for the applications that we support, uh, both, both uh, for our government sponsors and for our commercial applications to uh, serialize, pre-generate keys, serialize keys, and then have keys be distributed and then used at, at other locations. Anything either of you would like to add? I have nothing to add. Yeah, well, I, I would add that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would add that um, it's not just the keys that need to be serialized. It's actually the the context, and uh, that's because the the keys themselves uh, don't save all of the information necessary to reproduce all of the parameters that are that are uh, required for for the crypto systems. Right, and, and, and then there's, there's a follow up yeah, question. Are, Sorry. And there are, ex yeah. there is an, uh, there is examples about this uh, that that uh, will be listed later. Uh, that you can go look in the, uh, um, the repository, and that will give you um, a full, full worked out example of serialization and deserialization of of the various components. Great. And there is one follow up question from Hassan, and thank you for your questions, Hassan. Um, about key serialization and transport. Is there going to be a video about this later? Uh, short answer is, is yes. Um, this, we see this as uh, the most important part of, of crypto in general and, and homework for crypto in particular is the support for collaboration on data and, uh, and, and data sharing and sensitive data sharing. And so uh, we see this as a potential video uh, capable, basically a, a future episode and looking forward to it. So thank you for the questions, Asan. Okay. So um, I'll continue. So this is the last part of this talk. Um, uh, um, and then of course it will be Dave's talk. Um, so uh, the, some more advanced topics. So this is where we're, we're only going to touch some of them, uh, but uh, just wanted to show that they're some you know more advanced uh, functionality can be achieved as well and is, is available in Palisade. So in addition to primitive operations that we have discussed there are quite a few others more higher level operations and some of these are listed here. So the one of them for instance is eval sum which uh, you, essentially the capability is to compute a sum of you know batch size uh, of of the number of components that's basically determined by the batch size variable in an encrypted vector. So you can think of it as you have a vector with certain uh, basically integers and uh, you want to just call the sum function over that vector or a subset of that 
vector. So uh, eval sum is something that's available as an actual operation. Of course, internally it uses primitive operations, but uh, it's done in the most efficient manner. Then something that builds on top, of, uh, builds basically from it is the inner product operation. And uh, effectively what it does is it multiplies two vectors and then computes the val sum. So, uh, so, so the, the, these types of operations are used quite often. That's why they're exposed here. So another, another interesting uh, higher level function is eval mult many. And the idea is, it, let's say you have a chained uh, product of ciphertext similar to the example we considered previously, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and you want it to be this multiplication to be performed uh, using the least depth. So in other words, honoring the binary uh, tree multiplication approach. And uh, you can do it with a val mult many. So you just supply a vector of ciphertext and automatically do it in the most efficient way. Then there is another operation called eval merge. Let's say you have several ciphertexts that uh, uh, contain result in the first slot or I mean in slot zero, for instance, as the result of inner products, previous inner product operations, and you want to merge them together into a single ciphertext uh, and uh, put uh, what was in the slot zero uh, of each ciphertext sequentially in this new uh, compressed ciphertext. And eval merge is the operation that does this. So another somewhat more advanced um, aspect that we just wanted to briefly discuss here is uh, there are multiple ways to do addition in, uh, you know, in Palisade and just in homomorphic encryption. And uh, we'll illustrate uh, some of the differences between these approaches. Uh, so let's say we need to add 128 integers and assume that we're working with a certain ciphertext dimension 4K, which in this case is larger than 128 integers. And what's the most efficient packing uh, uh, to get uh, the, I mean, to get the least runtime for this computation? So one approach that could be used, uh, so we'll denote this as internal addition, is to basically run this eval sum operation that uh, I just described. And we pack 128 integers into a single ciphertext and we run eval sum. And uh, we only need to run eval sum over that the batch size of 128, not the full 4K. And under the hood, basically what this means is that uh, uh, this particular operation will require seven rotations. So, uh, the, so using the most efficient algorithm available. Uh, and uh, so that's the cost if we just use one ciphertext. And just as a very high level guideline, you can think of a rotation being at least 100 times more expensive than a valet. Of course, this number varies, but just it's at least two orders of magnitude higher. Uh, alternatively, we could use a different approach and we'll denote it as external addition. And uh, we, would, we would create 128 different ciphertexts, put each uh, integer into uh, ciphertext, uh, and then just perform 128 uh, eval adds, which are just trivial operations, very fast operations. And uh, in this particular case, this type of addition would be significantly faster. I mean, Again, based on this just ballpark estimates, at least like by a factor of six or something like that. But, uh, but uh, of, of course, uh, these numbers are more just uh, for illustration purposes. So from the runtime perspective, this external addition is faster. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to create 128 different ciphertexts. So there is a certain trade-off. So what is the constraint here? Storage or uh, runtime? And uh, the important note here is that depending on the trade-off between runtime and storage, we may choose one approach over the other or even a, a hybrid of the two approaches. Typically we choose a hybrid of, between two approaches. So this is just important to understand that any type of addition that's done internally, such as through eval sum, requires a rotation, which is an expensive operation. Uh, any type of external addition that's done across multiple ciphertexts can be done much cheaper because it doesn't require this rotation operation. Uh, so just one other somewhat advanced topic uh, is related to non-integers. So uh, before uh, approximate homomorphic encryption scheme was, uh, I mean, before ho approximate homomorphic encryption was proposed in the CKKS, in the CKKS paper, uh, BGV and BFE were used for uh, 
operations over non-integers. And uh, essentially any real number can be represented as an integer uh, with a desired fixed precision with a certain number of bits of precision. And for instance, if we have two, uh, if we have a variable in the range from minus seven to 10, and we need to support two decimal digits of precision, we can encode minus 7.00 as minus 700, minus 6.99 as uh, minus 699, and so on, 9.99 as 9999, and 10.00 uh, as 100. And then our goal is to choose the uh, plain text modules in such a way that we're not exceeding the bound of either minus p divided by two, the plain text modules divided by two, or uh, it could be negative or, or basically a positive bound. Uh, and uh, and when we perform the computations, of course, we need to uh, do some scaling down because initially we essentially scaled it up. We mul multiply by multiplied by essentially 100 the the inputs. Then we'll need to do some scaling to compensate for this when the multiplications uh, are done, for instance. And uh, there are some limitations of this approach. So uh, although it can be used, but uh, uh, one uh, limitation is that BGV and BFV uh, in this scenario uh, support only exact computations. And if we do a lot of multiplications, this scaling of let's say from 100 will go to much higher values. And we would need to choose a very, I mean, much larger plain text modulus P. And if we use a large plain text modulus P, uh, we're going to suffer in performance essentially. And this is why Palisade by default restricts uh, plain text modulus to 32 bit integers. And there are ways, more advanced ways to support more than this, but typically that's not something that's desired because the efficiency uh, directly depends on the plain text modules. So now, I mean, uh, I mean, in Palisade and in general homomorphic encryption, we would want to perform these operations uh, using approximate holomorphic encryption because uh, it, it provides a much better option and it does not have this uh, requirement for exact arithmetic. So this is just something to consider. Yes, uh, BGV and BFE can be used for non-integer arithmetic, but in many scenarios, uh, CKKS, uh, what we will cover approximate holomorphic encryption, what we will cover in the next webinar is a much more efficient, uh, a more, much more practical option. And then this is the last uh, slide. Um, uh, there are some things about selecting the ciphertext modulus. So typically, we already say, said it, it's determined by the multiplicative depth. But uh, there can be applications where we, when we need to do a really large number of additions. And for instance, one, one scenario could be when we represent a scalar multiplication as a lot of additions, like thousands of additions, uh, to minimize the noise growth. And uh, the notion of uh, multiplicative depth uh, is, gets somewhat changed because in this, I mean, like the typical scenario that we have in mind is there is a multiplication followed by a certain number of additions, typically not higher than hundreds, uh, and then we go to the next multiplication and multiplication determines the noise growth. In this case, if we have additions in the thousands or tens of thousands, this, the cost of the noise may be higher. And, and the effective depth in this type of uh, computation would be different from what we would predict from um, uh, just the multiplicative depth analysis. And something to keep in mind, if we get into a situation like this, uh, it's BFV typically handles them much better. And uh, because of the way uh, noise is accumulated, the parameters are selected there. In BGV, uh, we tie each level of granularity in Palisade to the multi to a multiplication. In BFV, there is no direct connection between the depth and the choice of uh, ciphertext uh, modulus parameters. Uh, so there's more flexibility. So if you run into a scenario like this, then BFV will, will give you, uh, bas uh, will be easier to configure to produce correct results. So this was the last slide of uh, my presentation. So Kurt, any other questions uh, uh, before we go to the presentation? Uh, no, no other questions. There's a few things that came in. I just answered uh, kind of quickly. 
Um, so I think this is maybe a good transition over to Dave. So Yuri, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, these will be up on YouTube in a few days. And uh, like I said, first in the series. And, uh, to, and thanks again. So handing it over to Dave. Um, Dave, as everyone knows, it's uh, someone who's been involved with Palisade for since the beginning. So Dave, please take it away. Yes, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we should take a, a one or two minute break for people so that who have been, been sitting for an hour who might want to uh, uh, take care of business. Um, what do you think? I think that uh, would probably be um, very gentlemanly of, of us. <laughs> All right, so why don't, why don't we uh, reconvene in about a minute or two, okay? Okay, thanks. So I'll leave my video on so that it okay. uh, doesn't look like we're totally blank for now. Yeah, and in the meantime, if there are any questions, then you know, we're happy to answer. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give my usual plug that uh, the Palisade Library is always looking for folks that want to contribute, um, either participate, give feedback, um, go forward and uh, help us improve the library. We take community building very seriously in, in, inside Palisade. And we've been very fortunate, I think, as part of this webinar to get a lot of really good questions and uh, actually new contributors to the library and also people that have been doing uh, bug identification. Um, you know, so Yuri, maybe something that you can do right now is that there were some questions that I answered for Hassan, um, I believe it was, about mm -hmm. the uh, notion of slots and what it really means. And so I'll just have you kind of maybe give your own answer to what I, I answered earlier also. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the yeah, first question is, good, what does- Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question is, where does the slot zero come from? Is it really the, the slot zero of HSMs? Uh, my very brief answer was that basically it's that we are uh, good software engineers and we count from zero um, in terms of the uh, coefficients of the polynomials. But Yuri, you can, of course, always give your own take also. Yeah, it's, it's, it's essentially just a vector of array. And uh, what we're referring to is uh, that the, the, uh, when we start indexing it, uh, uh, like we use the C++ approach of zero. So the first index, the very initial value in the vector is essentially zero, then one, two, three, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's probably, so this was probably more of a software engineering term than, than anything else. Yeah. Uh, the other side also is to give a little bit peek of the, what's, what's coming ahead is that we will be, as a community, we decided to take a hard look at uh, documentation and usability of the library, um, you know, demos and things like that. Um, so if anyone want, wants to provide, if there's new users for the library that would particularly be like to or, or um, has comments on documentation, we would especially welcome this in the coming weeks because something that we're gonna be looking at very hard um, as part of our next series of releases for Palisade, in addition to the usual things that we'd like to do in, in, in improving content and things like that. 